I have to say that I feel very honored to be here, and you will understand why. I'm following you since uh, the very beginning. So I'm sure uh, I will have to learn many things today from you, first of all. But I wanted to start by giving you um, some perspectives that might be in line with what you think, other things that are our concerns or what we are focusing on. And this presentation is on hand hygiene, and the next one is also on hand hygiene, but in the context of various guidelines. First of all, I wanted to highlight a couple of aspects of uh, the current research. Again, what is important, maybe more for us, but perhaps also for you, um, and some aspects that are really fo uh, fundamental for implementation. Talking about hand hygiene campaigns and campaigning, WHO perspectives, uh, what does it mean in terms of real progress around the world? And this is linked indeed to some specific examples of countries which I, I brought to your attention. So first of all, in terms of research, um, you may know that there has been a publication recently by uh, the Geneva colleagues uh, who analyzed the literature over uh, more than 50 years on hand hygiene, and they detected that there has been an incredible increase of, of the number of publication and research in this field, probably in, certainly in infection control is the most explored, but also in infectious diseases, I would say, probably it's re really a hot topic. Uh, and it seems that this has also uh, followed uh, the publication of CDC guidelines, uh, uh, WHO guidelines, the launch of uh, the WHO uh, campaign. Uh, what is also uh, interesting is to note that in the 50s, the median number of papers per year was four. And uh, uh, more recently, uh, over the last uh, uh, few years, uh, the median number is uh, uh, 554. So clearly, there has been a huge in in increase. And also, what is uh, interesting to note is that there has been a shift of terminology, fortunately, uh, because you are in the, in the area of excellence of uh, hand hygiene compliance, and I'm sure you talk about hand hygiene and not hand washing anymore. Uh, but there has been a shift indeed in the literature, in the keywords and search terms used, shifting today towards hand hygiene and hand disinfection. So this is a, a detail which is quite interesting. So this, the, topic, the first topic I would like to tackle in terms of uh, research, recent research, is uh, something that is bothering us a little bit recently for several reasons, uh, and it is the technique of hand hygiene action, not the moments. Uh, the technique. So you know that WHO uh, promoted uh, basically six steps for the technique and a specific duration, especially using alcohol based and rubs from 20 to 30 seconds. This is taken basically from the European norms um, tests that are used to uh, assess the efficacy of, of hand hygiene products where the technique used has these six steps. And as I said, the duration, as you know, considered to be effective is to, from 20 to 30 seconds. So this is the WHO approach. Uh, CDC promotes a technique which is much more rough, saying that you have to cover all surfaces of your hands and uh, until they are dried uh, and uh, also uh, the volume is uh, according to the indications by the manufacturers. Then, uh, for instance, the, France, the French Society of Hygiene has even more steps than WHO7, including the wrist. So there are variations. What really uh, bothers us is the fact that now there are various studies, including one by Andrew Stewardson in Geneva, which document that the actual uh, mm, compliance with this technique is very poor. 
it goes from 0% in some studies up to 30% uh, in terms of the technique, but also the duration is quite defective in general. Um, and so, uh, especially the, the, the research team in Geneva has uh, recently uh, tried to explore, but others as well. So, in terms of the technique, you may know this study published uh, recently, last year, uh, by a group in Glasgow, comparing the CDC and the WHO approach, demonstrating that microbiologically the WHO approach is more effective, but also recognizing that it requires 15% longer time uh, to achieve the desired uh, efficacy. Um, then there has been another study similar to this, but using a different uh, approach, focusing on these three actions, particularly these three steps, and, and this approach shows that um, uh, there is uh, uh, no difference, um, and therefore this is contrasting uh, with the previous one, um, which was in the direction of promoting the hand hygiene uh, WHO approach. Um, in addition, uh, the, the, the Geneva group has highlighted the importance of doing the step of fingertips first instead of at last, because there is more quantity of alcohol base and rub in your palm if you do it first, and therefore you achieve better efficacy, again, from the microbiological point of view. And regarding the time, again, the Geneva uh, group has now demonstrated that uh, the time uh, uh, from around 15 seconds has the same efficacy than longer time, the 30 seconds. Uh, there is no difference by using a standardized technique, of course. Um, and also another group uh, recently published the same, no difference between 15 and 30 seconds. So based on this, we are considering, and we will do this uh, next year, early next year, to rethink about this approach, specifically the, the fingertips one, you will see uh, if experts agree, we will uh, change our poster, put in that action first instead of last. But we will discuss with experts also related to the duration. And we'll see if they consider that the available new evidence is sufficient to state that you don't need to get to 30 seconds. We will see. So this is uh, something we haven't presented in conference so far, but I wanted to let you know. Now, uh, another aspect related to research and what we know um, is uh, about uh, uh, how hand hygiene positions within uh, IPC uh, guidelines. Um, we will talk about this later today, but what is important is that in the new IPC guidelines called the core components for effective IPC programs, um, one core fundamental recommendation is about implementing uh, IPC recommendations and best practices in the context of multimodal strategies. Um, and this uh, comes from the experience from hand hygiene. So, you know, I'm sure you know very well the diagram of the five components of uh, hand hygiene multimodal strategies, which is now reflected in a new approach uh, that we foster for any IPC intervention. Not only for hand hygiene, but we believe that applying the five components of the hand hygiene improvement strategy to any IPC improvement strategy works. And we hope that there will be progressive more evidence about this, but we will talk about this today and also especially tomorrow. But just to remind you, uh, we had proven in uh, 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 publishing in, in 2013 the effectiveness of the strategy in improving uh, hand hygiene compliance. And recently there has been a meta-analysis uh, published um, analyzing various studies, uh, 22 studies, assessing 
hand hygiene improvement strategies um, and the outcomes were hand hygiene compliance improvement, but especially reduction or the effect on healthcare associated infections. So uh, what is interesting, in my opinion, uh, from this publication is that um, various strategies, in particular the WHO five components mm -hmm. strategy, um, have been proven to be effective in reducing um, healthcare associated infections and in improving uh, compliance. But the one that is called WHO five plus, which is the five components plus additional three components that these authors identified has proven to be the most effective. And I strongly agree with this uh, assessment because those additional elements are goal settings, so establishing goals and targets in terms of hand hygiene compliance to be achieved, rewarding teams, uh, groups, hospitals, and accountability. Accountability actually is really part of the fifth component of the WHO strategy, which is cultural change, uh, patient safety, climate, improvement, etc. So ju just for our learning, this approach, the so-called WHO 5 plus, is the most effective uh, to reduce infections and to improve uh, hand hygiene compliance. So now, um, by looking again at the strategy, I would like to shift to the topic of campaigning, which uh, falls into the fourth component of the strategy, because that is called reminders in the workplace, but it's much broader. It's about communication, awareness raising, campaigning. And as you know, uh, we really uh, focused on that by launching a global campaign and inviting countries to have their own national campaigns. And you are one of the most uh, successful countries in having uh, started and, and sustained this initiative. So what we say today is that campaigning is how to sell our initiatives. Um, and indeed, uh, you can see in this graph that in terms of our campaign, which includes registrations from hospitals from around the world, we had really an exponential increase of the number of facilities coming on board every year, uh, with almost now 20,000 facilities around the world. Uh, what is important, in my opinion, in terms of evolving of this campaign, is that over the last few years, we haven't focused only on hand hygiene and problems related to hand hygiene, such as, uh, you may remember one year, it was on monitoring uh, and evaluation, another year was on, on patient participation, etc. Now we tend to continue to promote hand hygiene, sustaining the campaign, but really trying to see more hand hygiene in a comprehensive way um, in the context of IPC programs, in the context of the contribution of hand hygiene to reducing AMR, for instance. And at the end of this presentation, you will hear for the first time what is the focus now of next year. That is again in this philosophy or perspective. So campaigning means many times. Nowadays, it means a lot about social media and communi fast communications, uh, really viral spread of messages. Uh, and WHO, as, as others, have invested a lot in this. Uh, we have an entire team in uh, working only on this, and we analyze data related to the success of the campaign from the social media point of view every year. I'm not going to, to tell you the results into details, because I'm not an expert, but certainly every year it has been very successful. With um, this year, for instance, uh, WHO tweets on the hand hygiene in those days were almost 1.5 million, million times, or uh, retweeting was about 4,000 retweets, etc. So people experts in this field analyze this and, and really tell us the success compared to other campaigns, other messages, other events. 
and it seems we are very successful. And as you know, we promote this kind of activities like uh, uh, boards uh, with the, 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 the tweet messages or the hashtag of hand hygiene. Uh, you may have heard about the hand hygiene relays, uh, alcohol-based and drop relays around the world, breaking the, the Guinness Award. My question is, does this matter in terms of behavioral change? Change of practices, real excitement, which then translates in changing within clinical practices every year after we do all of this for one day per year. So I'm not sure, but certainly we can say that, for instance, all organizations, uh, international, national, every time come on board uh, and promote 5th of May. And like you, like Hand Hygiene Australia, uh, national initiative or state initiatives have the role of then sustaining throughout the rest of the year, but with education, with uh, other approaches, monitoring, etc. So probably this is promising in these regards. There are then examples of single institutions which uh, demonstrate their excellence in hand hygiene improvement, promotion, innovation, etc. And as you may know, they, they, we have now these Hand Hygiene Excellence Awards, which are promoted by us, by others. And so far, among 16 winners until last year, uh, there have been two hospitals in, uh, in Australia. And from these winners, there are some lessons learned. So uh, usually, these hospitals are hospitals that are able to involve important stakeholders and provide them feedback. Uh, with feedback so that they continue to gather support. They are able to engage the leadership and also to generate sense of ownership in their uh, staff so that they can sustain hand hygiene improvement over time. They have been able to customize specific interventions, adapting them to the local situation and culture. And also, they have been able to really embed hand hygiene in clinical practice in different disciplines. These are the main lessons learned from them. Now, I, I want to show some, some pieces of information and data about what is the progress of hand hygiene around the world and also some country examples before I conclude. But I just wanted to let you know that when I go around the world, like today, and I talk about countries, Australia is my favorite country. And this is why we put Australia as one of the examples in our key brochure about our program showing that um, we, when we show to tr we try to show what is the impact of any efforts in IPC uh, on patient outcomes and on patient safety. So Australia is there, um, even if I'm not going to talk about you today in my presentation. So we did um, uh, recently, um, recently in 2015 and before in 2011, a global survey about the progress of hand hygiene uh, programs according to the five components of the strategy and using this tool, which I know you have been using here in some uh, places at least, the hand hygiene self-assessment framework, which positions hospitals according to progress in four levels, inadequate, basic, intermediate, and advanced. And uh, the last survey, global survey we did in 2015 included uh, about 800 uh, facilities from 91 countries. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, most of these facilities, 77% were involved in a national hand hygiene campaign and 79% were part of our campaign. Um, the overall mean score was intermediate, so an intermediate level which can still be improved to advanced. Um, there were uh, lowest scores in the African region, um, as you can imagine, but also highest scores in the Southeast Asian region. 
Um, the best performing component in these programs was system change, as you can see here, uh, but also other areas had quite high scores, uh, maximum is 100, and the least uh, progressed was uh, the institutional safety climate. These are key questions or indicators in each of the components, and uh, the, the message I would like to give you is that uh, you can see that the scores overcome 50% uh, on average, but we have some peaks uh, that are really interesting, such as these two in terms of teamwork or commitment by the leadership to, to the hand hygiene program. And comparing the data in the facilities which participated also in our global survey in 2011, you can see that um, the score remains intermediate because uh, the lower uh, level for intermediate is uh, uh, 250, <laughs> but uh, it, it's really now the, 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 the mean is, is really towards the advanced. Uh, level, which is uh, starting from 376. So, two examples of two countries which, uh, like you, <coughs> have shown excellence, in my opinion, from completely different perspectives. One is uh, Germany. In Germany, there is a, a long-standing national campaign, but they, and they are doing things in a similar way to you for many reasons. They are really nationally coordinated. They do a lot of uh, uh, education. They created their own uh, tools for advocacy, for awareness raising, and so on. They follow uh, the WHO uh, approach, etc. Uh, they recently uh, measured um, hand hygiene compliance nationally, which is uh, between 70 and 75 percent on average in ICU and non-ICU wards, but they don't do hand hygiene compliance monitoring on a re regular basis. So they instead decided years ago to monitor only alcohol-based and drug consumption. I know today there are presentations talking about advantages and disadvantages of different ways of monitoring hand hygiene, and we will discuss later. But just to show you, over the years, from 20, 2007 until 2015, they have done this on a national basis, and you can see that at the hospital, at the ICU, and the non-ICU level, they uh, recorded a clear incre average increase that is substantial in all these different settings. And also, uh, what, what is interesting is that they noticed that there was an improvement in any uh, setting, but those settings which started lowest were also the best improving over time. And this is my last example. This is Liberia, which uh, you may know from Ebola, is a country where there is zero expertise in hand hygiene, no single person who has a certification. There was no IPC program until one year ago, and you know the consequences of Ebola in this country. There was no soap, no water in many places, and a disaster situation in terms of uh, uh, IPC. And so I'm really proud to show you that this country really raised up after the tragedy, and they established the IPC program, and they are able now to conduct hand hygiene compliance monitoring on a national basis in about uh, 30 hospitals uh, since last year. You can see their compliance rates. We don't have time, and I have to, f to conclude my presentation. But as you can see, there has been an, a progressive improvement. The last assessment positions them around 70%. I'm not sure that these data are accurate, entirely accurate, but I can tell you that the people doing this are trained by us, so we can hope that the situation is at least uh, uh, mostly reflecting the reality, in some hospitals at least. Best performers are midwives, but also doctors. So this is different from 
high-income countries, doctors in developing countries in many studies are best performers compared to nurses. Um, and you can see this uh, before and after contact with patient. These are their percentages. And um, I want to note that really they pay a lot of attention to the before moment, which is not the case uh, in many other studies. So they understood the, 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 the importance of this for preventing harm in patients. So I conclude by uh, now focusing on what is going to be um, Hand Hygiene Day next year. So as you may know, WHO has recently approved the resolution, WHO member states approved the resolution to uh, increase the attention on sepsis for prevention, diagnosis, clinical management, and prevention uh, concerns us. Uh, because uh, the burden of sepsis worldwide is really uh, quite relevant, more than 30 million cases every year. And I would like to make you notice uh, this important publication recently issued in the Lancet ID, which explored in Brazil, nationwide, what are the factors associated with mortality, sepsis mortality, and in their uh, random effect regression analysis, ident they identified that one of the factors increasing mortality among sepsis patients is healthcare associated sepsis. So, this is why next year our focus will be hand hygiene improvement in sepsis prevention, with particular focus on specific areas or populations such as uh, NICUs, maternal wards, uh, because maternal and neonatal sepsis worldwide is a very relevant problem. So we will let you know more about it, uh, but it's important, I think, once again, in the perspective of uh, pushing hand hygiene improvement within clinical practices in specific disciplines or areas, uh, which are most uh, important for uh, patient uh, reasons, for population at risk reasons, and this is obviously from the global perspective. Um, so, thank you very much for your attention, and um, I'm uh, looking forward to listening to you later. Benedetto, one of the issues, I guess, that everyone asks, and particularly in Australia, where the program's been running for some years, is, well, how do we know that it actually makes a difference to infection rates and HAI rates and so forth? And it's a difficult thing to measure. Do you want to just make a comment on this? Because there have been some things with the ECDC and HAI surveillance and so forth. But do you have a, uh, what's your opinion about this? Uh, well, um, to, to demonstrate uh, um, the effect of hand hygiene on uh, HAI's rate is difficult and, and the literature doesn't uh, include many studies as you all know, but if you want to convince someone, I think that the best publication you can uh, have is the one I showed you. Uh, the meta-analysis, network meta-analysis really which explored this and, and was able to, to show some important pieces of information uh, summarize the, uh, summarizing the evidence. Otherwise, uh, of course, there are a number of studies which uh, have uh, demonstrated uh, the effect of hand hygiene uh, on HAI rates, the problem uh, in most cases is uh, the reliability of these data in, in, in terms of what is the study design. Uh, as you know, there are no many RCTs uh, in this field and even uh, a low number of controlled before-after studies. Uh, these exist. There are some good proofs of this. Um, at your country, you have a couple of interesting publications that, of course, uh, have limitations as well, as we know. Um, so this is, we will talk about this later uh, because uh, we had serious difficulties in developing the core components guidelines in terms of the quality of the evidence to show impact of hand hygiene, but also of other interventions to reduce the HAIs because of the quality.
Thanks very much, Bernadette. We'll hear again from you.